Tutor. Um, and uh, welcome to the seminar of the International Institute of Physics. Thank you very much for participating. And it's my pleasure to introduce Ilya Grusberg, who will give a talk today. Ilya received his PhD from Yale University in, um, in 1998. After that, he did a couple of postdocs. He was a postdoc at MIT and at, in uh, Santa Barbara at Kavli Institute. And he is a, uh, uh, since 2002, he is a professor. He was a professor at the University of Chicago. And in 2013, he moved to Ohio State University. Ilya is, is, is a recipient of many prestigious grants and, fell, and uh, awards. And one of them is uh, the prestigious, one of the most prestigious fellowships for postdocs, the Papalarda Fellowship that he received in MIT. Um, so Ilya is working, he's also, by the way, he's a uh, frequent visitor of, of, of our institute. And this time he came uh, virtually. He participated in different events and organized the program himself. Uh, he's, a, he's an expert in uh, classical and quantum condensed matter, although his research is quite interdisciplinary and he applies uh, advanced mathematical tools to study different phenomena in condensed matter like uh, disordered condensed matter systems, uh, localization, superconductivity, or problems in classical condensed matter like um, uh, diffusion limited aggregation, uh, uh, stochastic growth, and so on. So today, Lia will tell, tell us about uh, quantum uh, phase, about phase transitions and quantum Hall effect, uh, which uh, appear, which take, uh, which happen between when when one changes between plateaus of integer conductivity and integer quantum Hall effect. So Ilya, please, I, I, I uh, pass the word to you. And I ask everybody to keep microphones uh, switched off during his talk. And after the talk, please sign up in the, uh, our chat to ask a question to observe the order of questions. Thank you very much, Ilya. Thank you very much for accepting our invitation. Thank you, Dima. Uh, so it's a pleasure to be here virtually. You can see I long to be on that beach and that June is, you know, <laughs> calling, <laughs> but uh, well, some other time perhaps. Um, all right, so um, so I want to talk to, to you about some recent work I, uh, I did with, uh, with a team of people from Berkeley. Um, so uh, will be, it will be based on two papers. One is published by now, the other is uh, being reviewed. Um, but it's available in the archive. And uh, it will be mostly about some numerical work, but I will introduce the subject and I will talk in general about why this is so interesting and mysterious. And uh, two of my co-authors, um, so let me acknowledge them. This is Elizabeth, Bjorn, and Joel. They're all from Berkeley and Elizabeth and, and Bjorn are in the audience. So I, I hope they can help me if I get some difficult questions that I'm not able to answer. So, um, okay, um, indeed. So we are talking about the integer quantum Hall effect. And traditionally, this phenomenon has been observed in two dimensional electron gases. It's a different story. It's a separate story, how you create a two dimensional electron gas. But if you manage to just imagine electrons moving in two dimensions, you put them in a strong magnetic field, cool them down to very low temperatures. Then what you see is that uh, classically, you would expect the whole resistance to rise as a function of the magnetic field in a linear fashion. But at higher magnetic fields, this trace of the whole resistance develops this very well quantized plateaus, which are labeled by integers. And uh, the whole resist resistance on these plateaus is quantized with the N. Maybe I can highlight this with a laser pointer. So this N here and this denominator is an integer which is quantized with the accuracy of parts in a billion. So it's really a fantastic you know, phenomenon and uh, very robust, very universal as we see, because it doesn't really depend on the 
type of material, shape, size, disorder in the sample. So it's quite, quite robust. And uh, so you can understand, or one can understand this really well within a single particle picture, where one can argue that this n is so robust because it's a topological number. It's actually an integer required by topology, which is called a chair number. Um, so this is all um, pretty well understood, but what about the transition? So you see that as you vary the field, you can go from one plateau to another, and then to the next one, and so on. By the way, simultaneously with the transition from the one quantized value of the whole resistance, you see a spike in the longitudinal resistance. Right? So this is the spikes represent the longitudinal resistance along the iron flow. Right? Um, but let us try to see what happens if you zoom in on the transition region. So what one can do then is one can look, so this is an experimental trace, a part of that, well, not that diagram on the previous slide, but a similar diagram from a more recent paper, where you can follow the behavior of the whole resistance as a function of the magnetic field, but at different temperatures. Okay. So um, you can see that if you do it at high temperature, the step between the plateaus is kind of smeared, but as you lower the temperature, the step becomes sharper and sharper, and its slope becomes larger and larger until eventually we expect it to diverge in an infinite system. And so in fact, indeed, if you plot the logarithm of the slope of this step as a function of the logarithm of the temperature, you see a straight line. And this, this experiment was a heroic effort that allowed to extend this trace to you know, single millikelvins, really. And so that was quite a, quite a remarkable achievement to see this beautiful linear straight line scaling, a power law scaling of this derivative with the temperature over more than two decades in temperature. And so one typically says that if you see this scaling behavior, that's an example of something which is called the critical phenomenon that accompanies some continuous phase transition. And the exponent here in the temperature scaling is expected to be related to some localization length exponent nu, which I'll talk about, and some other exponent z, which is really a property of an interacting system. So if you, if you wave your hands and make some assumptions or do some additional experiments, you can try to extract this localization length exponent. It turns out to be some number. And uh, what's interesting is that this is an example of a property that is supposed to be universal on the basis of a different type of universality. So I already talked about universality related to the topological quantization, but there's another type of universality based on the idea of uh, continuous phase transitions described being described by uh, by universal RG flows and fixed points whose vicinity is controlled by some universal beta functions. So, well, so even experimentally, this is an interesting question whether one can reproduce this in different systems. And there are lots of lots of experiments, especially recently uh, after the discovery of graphene and the quantum anomalous Hall effect, there are many, many different systems now being studied, uh, not only uh, for their you know, properties of phases and phase diagram, but the transitions as well. So only recently there was a beautiful you know, paper on integer quantum flow tra uh, transition quantum anomalous whole effect. And uh, well, I mean, I don't think at, at the time, at, at this time people in these other systems can achieve such a beautiful um, you know, large, large amount of scaling. Um, range, but but still, I mean, seems to be that exponents that they get are more or less consistent with this. But the point is, one, one thing that I want to make is that to, to understand experiments, one really has to think about interactions. And uh, the problem, it turns out, uh, is, is complicated even without interactions. So one can adopt this uh, point of view that let us try to first solve or think about or understand the problem without interactions and then, then add them perhaps, right? 
uh, if the interactions are weak, uh, they may be sort of innocuous and uh, not spoil too much of the non-interacting picture. So let me adopt this, this point of view and, and assume that we have no interactions. And then the problem really becomes a single particle problem of an electron moving in the presence of a magnetic field and the random potential. So this is a problem of Anderson localization. So um, on the next slide, I'll show what it is, but okay, uh, before I do that, even conceptually, if you want to think about how you would extract anything like a critical exponent from, from, from any theory, you have to think about some, some field theory. And the problem of just a single electron moving in the presence of disorder and undergoing what's called an Anderson transition is very hard. Um, at least in this context of the integer quantum hole transition, there's no small parameter that can be used to access the fixed point of that theory. Um, even though you can write a theory, which is called the nonlinear sigma model with a topological term, um, it's been advanced back in the 80s, early 80s. Uh, and the problem with that theory is that it is expected to have a fixed point that describes this integer quantum hole phase transition between the zero and one being quantized values and two quantized values of the whole conductivity. Um, but from the point of view of that field theory, the nonlinear sigma model, this fixed point is in the strong coupling regime. So we don't really have any tools to access it or its vicinity to, to say anything about the critical behavior, right? So that's been a puzzle for quite some time, well, as you see, for many, many years. Now, uh, once you start thinking about just a single particle without interactions, the problem is really two dimensional, right? You just work at a fixed energy. It's a two plus zero dimensional field theory. And so at a continuous phase transition that we expect to have in the system, we expect again to have a description in terms of a two dimensional conformal field theory, CFT. Uh, then specific, uh, some specific aspects of this being a disordered system can immediately be used to tell you that this, going, this is going to be some non-unitary field theory with the central charge equal to zero. And these are uh, some of the harder field theories because I mean, the usual unitarity you know, properties are lost and one has to rethink the whole thing. So, so this has been assumed that this is sort of a CFT for some time, but nobody could you know, guess what that was until some recent uh, advances that I'll mention very soon. But, but for a long, long time before these theoretical advancements have been made, people were resorting mostly to numerics to study this, um, this transition. And you have to model it in some way. Um, so let me, start thinking about a model. So for some reason, I'm sorry, but some, for some reason my slide disappeared. So let me get back to it. Yes, and unhide it. I don't know what happened to it. Yeah, that's the slide I was meant, I was planning to show. Right, so, okay, so let's, let's just get back to it. So this is the Hamiltonian of a single action moving in the presence of random potential. All right, and the basic picture here that we understand very well is that if you switch off the random potential, then you get just a Landau level problem. So all the states are organized themselves in Landau levels uh, with some cyclotron gaps in between. And what happens when you introduce disorder back, then it, it shifts, it lifts the degeneracy of these Landau levels and broadens them into Landau bands that are shown here schematically as the function of the density of states, uh, the function of energy. And, uh, but what's more interesting or important for this problem is that most of these states get localized by disorder. So the states and the tails of lambda bands are localized and only uh, in, at some of these uh, discrete sets of energies, the states are extended. And then, you know, every time your Fermi energy crosses one of these states, you get a transition between the plateaus. 
right? But the spatial extent of a state that is localized, the so-called localization length, is a function of energy. And it's shown here in this dashed line, maybe not very well visible, but this dashed line signifies that this localization length becomes larger and larger as you approach the energy of the transition, this, this critical point. And so this divergence is a, sign is a, is a you know, signature of some continuous phase transition. And we want to understand the universality class of this phase transition and maybe the critical exponents. So conventional critical scaling behavior would, would tell you that the regulation lengths, similar to correlation lengths in magnets near phase transitions, would diverge as you approach this energy to the critical energy in a power law fashion with this exponent new. That's the exponent that appeared already in the experimental slide. And we want to at least be able to understand, to find this numerical value of this exponent. So that's been a goal for many, many simulations in the past decades. All right. Um, okay, so let me show you how you can try to model this. So one idea is to think about disorder as being a smooth disorder with some correlation lengths of the disorder being much bigger than the cyclotron radius of electrons in this strong magnetic field. And then you can uh, imagine that you have this profile in the potential and the electron states follow these equipotential lines as some skipping orbits, right? So the semi-classical picture is very useful here in, in terms of building the intuition. And so when you change the chemical potential, you begin with an empty lambda level, but then you add a little bit of electrons and they form this well-separated puddles at the bottoms of the potential wells. When you start increasing the chemical potential, some of the puddles reconnect, right? They, they grow and connect. And so the size of the wave function becomes bigger and spreads. So that's your localization length increasing, right? And eventually the state spreads throughout the whole system. This is where your transition point is achieved. And ultimately you flood the whole thing. And then the states and the bulk are still localized. They're circling now about the, uh, around the tops of the mountains in this potential landscape. But there are two edge states that are developed on the edges of the system. We have the confined potential. And those edge states are responsible for the quantized transport on the plateau, all right? So viewed this way, this is a very similar to a classical percolation transition, but the essential difference is that their electrons are phase coherent objects and they uh, interfere, different paths that you can traverse interfere, and they also can tunnel across settled points. So in particular, before you close this gap over here, right, you can actually jump across and your wave function can spread faster than the size of the classical puddle. And in fact, that's what it, what happens. Um, and now to model this, well, it's still a very complicated picture. So Chalker and Coddington back in 88 came up with a very nice idea to replace this complicated landscape by just a, a rectangular, but square, square lattice. So every settle point here that can provide a mechanism for jumping or tunneling across is simply replaced by a point, a vertex, on, on a square grid, right? And the electrons can move along the links between these nodes. And then the tunneling at the nodes is represented by some sketching matrices that you know, uh, can uh, be described as having, providing some amplitudes for turning right or turning left at the node. And um, the randomness here is introduced through the random phases on the links. And uh, again, I, I, I will try to avoid a lot of details. I'll just give you the, Mm, the flavor and the results of this approach. So the point is that once you made this into a regular square lattice, this model is very easy to simulate on a computer. There are very well developed techniques to uh, study transport in this system by applying transfer matrices. You can sort of slice the system vertically into slices and each slice can be described by a transfer matrix. You can just multiply these transfer matrices and. There's a lot of, lot of results that can be obtained this way. And uh, Chokra and Coddington themselves in 88 obtained the estimate of the 
this critical exponent nu for the population length based on this technique. But that had a pretty large error bars. And at the time, as you can see, it's, it's pretty consistent with the experimental results, which were available already at that time. So 2.38, 2.4 is certainly within this range, right? So that was claimed as a success. Later refinements of numerical techniques shifted this exponent a little bit. And uh, until 2009, uh, everybody was happy. There, was, there seemed to be an agreement between experiment and theory. But then suddenly uh, in 2009, there was a paper by Slavin and Oksuki who pointed out that um, we are always working in a finite size system numerically. And one has to take into account this by so-called finite size corrections to scaling. And these are uh, turn out to be extremely large and pronounced in this particular problem. So keep taking account of them carefully is, is really a pain in the neck. And uh, so, but people have managed to do, that, to do that. And after 2009, there's a consensus now that in this model, well, at least until recently, people were believed, believed to, to have this exponent to be with rather small error bars, about 2.6, right? So it's one thing, it's significantly different from earlier results. And also it's significantly different from, from experimental values. But relating to experiment is a complicated issue that does require really the understanding of interactions in the system. So I'm not sure I can say anything about this. But even within non-interacting models, one can still ask, so what's happening? What, why do we see this change in the exponent? Is it just really a numerical artifact of taking into account some better, you know, better, you know, taking into account some finite size corrections to scaling and stuff like that? Uh, instead, we can try to think what other models would 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 be useful to study. And in this regard, it's interesting. The history here is quite uh, remarkable. So. Haldane, back in the 80s, same year as Chuck and Connington uh, introduced their model, Haldane introduced a model where he argued that he could have a quantized whole conductivity without any magnetic field, right? So he was essentially predicting the existence of anomalous quantum pole effect. At that time, it was not known by this name. Uh, this paper uh, was completely unnoticed. I mean, it, so, so only with the advent of the topological insulators and uh, topological band theory, people started paying attention to it, and now it's highly cited and famous, right? But okay, but when you just look at it, it's a clean model, just some tight binding model with some complex phases, breaking time reversal invariance introduced on various for various hops on the lattice. If you look at just the low energy sector of this model then it looks like a Dirac uh, problem, a problem of a Dirac particle, Dirac fermion moving into dimensions. And um, there are two of them in, the, in fact in this model, but let's focus on just one of them. So if you just have one Dirac fermion, the mass here uh, is responsible for the gap in the spectrum. But if your energy is in the gap, then you get a whole, quantized whole conductivity. Right, and depending on the sign of this mass, it's positive or negative. It's quantized in this case by plus minus a half. Okay, this is not a contradiction with the integer quantization of Chern numbers, because what really happens is there is a second fermion, right? So a second Dirac fermion that, again, uh, you know, allows you to add one half or minus one half. So the total number can be anything between minus one, zero, and one. Right. Okay. Um, so. So what then is happening is that you can have a whole transition in a system without the disorder, right? And uh, just by tuning the mass of this Dirac fermion, you can jump from one quantized whole plateau to another. And it's naturally interesting to see what happens if you have disorder. And um, so there was another paper in 94 by Ludwig Fischer, Shankar, and Greenstein that were thinking about this and they realized also that there's a lattice model whose low energy spectrum is a Dirac spectrum and you can tune the phase, you can create a phase transition, whole transition in that system. They don't cite Haldane, 
I, I never asked them why, but my hunch is that they didn't know about that paper. That paper was so obscure and not noticed that they didn't, they didn't even cite it. So they sort of rediscovered it. And uh, then they said, okay, just by symmetries, if you think about what kind of symmetries you have in the system, in the quantum hole system, there's no, there are no symmetries except unitarity. There is a symmetry classification for single particle zoded systems, and we know all the classes. Uh, and this is the, in some sense, the least symmetric class. There are no symmetries at all, right? So now if you take your Dirac Hamiltonian and add all possible disorders that break all the symmetries, these authors claimed or conjectured that you should get a transition in the generic quantum hole, integer quantum hole universality class. Okay, that was a conjecture, and uh, there were some arguments in favor of it, but nobody has actually done a careful check of the statement numerically. So there was some paper in 2008 that was studying some similar problem, and the rock fermions in the uniform field and potential disorder, but but the results were not the numerics were not high quality, so there was no no even not error bars given on this exponent, except that you notice that the exponent is significantly different from 2.6, sort of the, uh, the uh, conventional value for the integral hole agreed upon after 2009. Okay, um, so as I mentioned, this is also now becoming very relevant experimentally because of the quantum anomalous hole effect. There are multiple, multiple papers describing this scaling in this system, but um, let me proceed with theoretical analysis. So what we decided to do, we decided to actually simulate this disordered Dirac fermions directly on a computer and see what happens, what, what the transition is. So here are the results. So this is the first slides with my results or our results. So essentially what happens is that metallic region here, which exists if your energy exceeds the mass in the clean system disappears. Instead, it's replaced by a critical state at zero mass and quantized Anderson insulator on both sides. So these are Chern insulators or Anderson insulators with non-trivial Chern numbers on both sides of the transition, all right? And then you can go across this transition by varying mass and just extract by standard techniques the scaling of your uh, localization lengths. And um, what happens is that, amazingly enough, if you tune this energy and you change the energy as you go across the transition, you get different values of the critical exponents. All right, so that was very surprising because based on universality arguments, so the conjecture of uh, Ludwig et al. was that just by symmetries, you this, this system is placed in the same universality class as the interquantum hole transition, but numerics do not support that, okay? You get different exponents, and moreover, exponents depend on the energy, which is, you know, very unusual, right? So this is um, a puzzle, and we didn't really understand this at the time we got these results. We, they were sufficiently interesting to, to allow us to publish this, but, but we didn't have a good understanding what this whole thing means. We proposed some scenarios. One could explain that, for example, by the existence of you know, a couple of fixed points with a crossover between them, or maybe a whole line of fixed points, which would be very unusual, but, but still these things exist in statistical mechanics. All right, so that was one result, but already interesting. And um, somehow the reality seems to be broken. So the picture, uh, when we publish this paper, this is sort of a brief history of numerical results. As you can see, they're starting with chocolate encoding from this huge error bar. Uh, results have you know, come down to 2.4, 2.3, stayed there about some time. I mean, there are more points that could be added to this diagram, but we didn't show them. So then there's a jump to this 2009 to around 2.6, right? And then we have this Dirac story here. And there are some other models, the lattice models and uh, 
some geometric disorder story that I don't have time to talk about. But the point is that the, well, numerics is a highly sophisticated business these days where you can be confident that your result is within some error bars that, that are pretty small. I mean, they, of course, they're different from study to study, but they do not overlap. You see, they're scattered all over the place. And that's, that's a serious puzzle. That's a serious challenge to the universality concept, all right? So something is missing here. And um, so the story turned uh, completely in 2019 when Martin Cernbauer proposed a explicit specific conformal field theory that he believes describes this particular fixed point. And it's a, some type of supersymmetric Wesemian and Novik of Witten model with a certain marginal perturbation. I, I'm not going to go into details. It's a complicated theory and it's not my point really to uh, explain it today, but I will highlight a very important, very important predictions from this theory. So one of them is that nu turns out to be in this theory, turns out to be infinity. And I'll explain what it means really. It's not kind of, uh, it's very unusual, right? So it's, um, Instead of having two point something, you have an infinity. So how do we reconcile this? Um, so, but uh, this theory also predicts that you can sort of still expect to fit your data according to conventional scaling with some apparent or effective scaling exponents that should depend logarithmically on the system size. Then if this is true, then can we even hope to see the true universal critical behavior numerically? If logarithmic scaling is present somehow, you would have to have enormous system sizes to even see it, right? because logarithms are very slow. So nevertheless, Martin made a few more predictions that allowed us to test this, this, this theory. And this is what our second paper is about. So let me um, sort of introduce this in, in the context of the uh, renormalization group flows. So this is the way to think about this thing. So this is the original kroeskin hunitsky flow diagram with this fixed point here. And first of all, uh, before Martin's proposal, we certainly know the value of the critical hole conductivities. This is simply based on some symmetries. It corresponds to theta angle being pi in this field theory. Uh, but the critical value of the longitudinal conductivity was just known numerically about 3.6, not precisely. Nevertheless, suppose we know these numbers, then we can find define the deviations from them, call them delta plus and delta minus. Delta minus is a irrelevant perturbation that decays. You see this flows from above and from below. They flow into the fixed point. That's the stable direction, right? The other direction, as you change sigma x, y, is unstable. And so we call it delta plus. So the flows are away from this point in this direction. Right? So that's the natural, that's the usual description of a uh, fixed point with a single relevant direction that's supposed to describe some universal critical phenomena. Now, the Vicinity of this fixed point can be described by the renormalization group flows, renormalization, renormalization group equations in terms of this logarithmic uh, lengths, logarithm of the lengths of the system. And the right-hand side of these equations are some functions of delta minus and delta plus called the beta functions. And you, the usual story in the RG is that <coughs> this scaling, this, this beta functions should be some non-singular functions of the parameters. Right, that's uh, that's uh, one of the basic premises of the RG. And you should be able to expand them in small deviations from, from the fixed point. And the natural guess that if you have a conventional fixed point, then there will be linear terms in, in this expansion, right? So this coefficient here, y, should be negative to describe this irrelevant scaling, right? Approach the fixed point along the critical line. And new inverse is the scaling across the transition, and that's directly related to the localization length exponent one can show. Okay, so it's new inverse, okay? All right, so now 
here comes Martin and says that first of all, this theory predicts exactly the value of the fall conductivity, fall conductivity is known, but the longitudinal conductivity of the fixed point he predicts from this theory to be two over five, which is close enough to 0.6, but uh, still it's an exact number. Moreover, he says that there's a fixed point theory and any perturbation that you can add there on physical grounds, he argues, is marginal, right? So there's no linear terms in the beta functions. So that's what, what means to have new infinity. It's the new inverse, the zero, that's the absence of the uh, linear term in the beta function. So, so, okay. At this point, you can sort of just take it away and just start thinking about what happens if this is true. And just on the basis of the general sort of topology of the flow, we expect phenomenology of this story still to be described by something like this. So we, we do expect some stable direction and some unstable direction. But if you do not allow for these linear terms to be there, then you have to go beyond the linear order and then uh, you get these equations, okay? This is just generic assumption of absence of the linear terms and overall symmetries of the fate flow diagram that tell you that this should, that should, that should happen. And indeed, if you just simulate this numerically, you get something which is pretty similar to the flow diagram that I showed earlier. I mean, this, the local structure is slightly different, but that's not surprising have different equations, but global structure is more or less the same. And what I should point out is that we don't have now this linear terms with exponents y and nu that used to be thought as universal critical exponents. Now, instead, we should have these b1, b2, b3, and b4 to, to be viewed as universal data, universal numbers replacing the critical exponents. And that's that's the goal of the theory now is extracting these numbers and seeing what they are and so on, all right? And uh, it turns out that since you know the critical conductivity, one can actually study just the flow along this critical line, vertical line, which simplifies drastically. If you set delta plus to zero, you get a very simple equation, which contains a single parameter, V1, that can be immediately integrated and one can directly test it by computing the, the longitudinal conductivity in an actual numerical system and plotting it for different system sizes and seeing whether the scaling is satisfied, all right? So that's a very uh, nice way to test it. But one thing I wanted to mention is that the models that I mentioned so far, namely the Dirac fermions and the choker coddington are all such that they start for you know, their conductivities at the microscopic length scale, what I would call the Druda conductivities, are all below the critical conductivity. They all start from below. So that's not sufficient to sort of study this whole global picture. So we uh, wanted to get something where this inequality in the, in the opposite sense, and we realized that there is a model where you have two choker Coynton models on top of each other, they, they're coupled. And if you couple them, you get the, uh, you know, richer phase diagram with two parameters that can control transitions. And also the uh, Druda conductivity of this system is higher. So we can approach the fixed point from above, hopefully. So let's see how this works. So this is one of the, again, resulting slides. Um, let me try to walk through it. So, as I said, we, we are testing this logarithmic scaling of the deviation of the longitudinal conductivity from the critical value. So this bar, black bar, is the critical value, two over pi, exactly known in this theory. The dots are numerical data. Um, and we just try to fit this data for different systems, the usual chalk recording to model, Choker coin model with two layers and the Dirac fermions. They're all here. And as you see, the brown line is the approach of the choker coin model with two layers from above. And the, um, the idea is that if this transition is universal, if this fixed point is universal describing all these systems, then this B1 
should be the same for all of them, right? So let's try to extract it from the data simply by plotting this quantity. So if you solve this previous equation in terms of B1, this is what you get. And we just directly take numerical data and plot this as a function of length scale and see that we get a straight line pretty much for uh, all the systems, right? Maybe Dirac fermions are slightly below, but uh, still within error bars. It's about 45, a large number, but that's what we get. Mm. Now, uh, an interesting uh, twist is that you see the prediction of the exact longitudinal conductivity two over pi at the fixed point was pretty important. If we wanted to use it as a fit parameter, we would not get such a nice scaling at all. In fact, if you intentionally change your two over pi by a tiny amount, by about you know five thousands or less than that, then the data, first of all, becomes length dependent. You see the slopes here in these triangles, right? That's these are these are the fits to, of the data of the conductivity with a different assumption about longitudinal conductivity at the fixed point, and they immediately deviate very strongly from the 45 result. They, they start being length dependent. And interestingly, in different models, the deviation goes in the opposite directions. So for the brown data, for the CC2, the deviation is in the opposite direction. So the lower triangle goes down here, but goes up for the blue points of the CC1 model. So that indicates that somehow the two power pi is indeed some special. It seems to be a, a true uh, number, true conductivity of the fixed point. And uh, so we believe that this, this data supports the uh, what we call the marginal scaling scenario of Martin Sernbauer. Um, but um, we wanted to go beyond that and try to understand it slightly better. So one can do the following. And Martin himself suggested this, um, that you can try to think about how this system equations looks like and behaves. Uh, this is just a rescaled version of it, right? This A and B are some combinations of the previously, uh, previously introduced B1, B2, and so on. Well, so you see, if you, what I did so far, I neglected this term, delta plus squared, and I solved this equation, and it produced some logarithmic behavior. If you introduce these terms back and just numerically simulate this, this, these differential equations, you get some behaviors of the delta minus and delta plus as a function of the length scale. And they, as you see, delta minus indeed very, very slowly varies for a long, long time. And then it jumps to minus infinity or diverges really, right? And delta plus likewise sort of smoothly varies and then diverges. And you can cut off this behavior and declare that this is your localization links where it happens, right? And then you can plot this localization links as the function of the initial starting point, delta plus. That's what you get here. And these can be reasonably fit by a straight line. So that would imply the conventional scaling. And the way to understand it is that if you look at this second equation, you can think about this term as pretty much a linear term in delta plus. The coefficient is certainly a function of the scale, but it's a, it's a very slow function, right? It's just a logarithmically varying function. So you can think of this coefficient as an eff effective localization length exponent, somewhat averaged over length scales maybe, right? But, you know, there's, we, we can have a more precise understanding of this. But roughly speaking, numerical simulations of these differential equations just shows you that the data can exhibit sort of a traditional scaling, except that the slope of these straight lines very strongly depends on the initial value of the longitudinal conductivity, right? So that means that the universality in the usual sense is lost but it's now transferred to the universality of B1 and the possibility of tuning the effective localization length exponent by going to a different system, all right? 
that's that's um, indeed. So now we can just directly measure the localization exponents of our uh, traditional systems. The CC1 has been known for a long time, as I said, to be about 2.6. But this model with the uh, two layers is quite a bit harder to simulate. Nevertheless, we, we were able to, you know, again, it's some technical advancement that we think is pretty important. Some novel scaling variable can, introduce, can be introduced that, that is easier to handle than the traditional methods. And then you get this very nice scaling with the system size and the effective exponents are considerably different from the choker Coddington single layer model. So that's consistent with our observation that the usual universality is lost. You can tune the critical exponent by just tuning the drew the conductivity in the model. And hopefully the universality remains within this B1 with marginal parameters of the marginal flows. Okay, so this is pretty much all I wanted to say because we, we only really have numerics, not really a deep theoretical understanding. Let me try to summarize this and maybe point out some open questions. So, um, so one thing we did, we analyzed the critical behavior of disordered Dirac fermions, and we learned that this differs from the Chopra recording from model, the critical exponent for relation lengths, at least numerically observed. Now we sort of think that these new are also effective news. They're not true uh, scaling exponents. Their effective exponents appearing from this marginal flows. And that's why they may be non-universal. That's why they depend on the energy. Because the changing the energy certainly changes the draw the conductivity of this model. All right. So this uh, critical scaling of looking to the conductivity in different models that I showed here supports the uh, marginal flow scenario of Turnbauer. And significant variation of the respondents new may be explained by this mimicry mechanism within this scenario. Well, so the story is not over though, because the um, very recently Martin managed to compute this B1 from his theory, within his theory. So it's a, it's a very explicit control field theory with an action that you can really do OPEs and stuff like that. And his prediction for this B1 is pi squared over eight, which is a order one. And so it's a lot smaller than what we observed numerically. So it's certainly some uncomfortable contradiction here. But um, well, one can still try to reconcile it by, it's, it's not finished, so we need to think about it more. But, but strictly speaking, what Martin does is uh, the, the normalization of the coupling constants in his bulk field theory. What we measure is actually a Landauer conductance in a finite sample of finite size sample. These are not simply related. They're not, they're not directly equal to each other, right? So um, the conductivity itself is fine, but the conductance in the finite sample is a phase coherent quantity and needs to be you know, computed really from the theory. And that's not been done for uh, the theory away from the fixed point, okay? So there may still be some hope to see this 45 in the theory. Uh, one other troubling aspect of this whole story is that if you go back to the scale, to this plot, so the, um, the scaling variable as a function of the lengths, we don't see any curvature similar to the curvature observed here. Right? So this curvature signifies that this effective exponent is not really a constant. It should be dependent on the scale, on the system size. But we don't see it in our numerical simulation. So these are very fine straight lines. And again, the only possible explanation we have so far is that maybe we don't have a sufficient range of L's. We just only have one decade here. And uh, so this may not be sufficient to do this logarithmic behavior. In any case, I think uh, this is a very exciting development that happened over the past couple of years and uh, more work is expected and needed to really get a good understanding of this. Thank you for your attention. Thank you, Ilya, for a beautiful talk. Uh, and I ask everyone who has questions to please sign, sign up in our chat uh, to ask your question. So I don't see any questions so far. 
Um, while people are thinking, I have a question of my own um, about this double um, chocolate cognitive model. So what's the motivation to consider this double model? Okay, I, I have, um, let me give you a few things to, to um, so the earliest motivation that I would think was really coming from physical uh, picture of actual electrons having a spin, right? So you have uh, spin up and spin down and the system is in strong magnetic field. So you, you really expect this um, electrons to have different energies and uh, occupying different Landau levels. So the spin split Landau levels, but in some materials you can suppress the G factor and the Zeeman energy can be smaller and these, these electrons can be close in energy. Then you have sort of two layers, and that's what Choker, Choker himself was thinking about when he introduced this double layer model. But later, I think for, on theoretical grounds, you can start to think of mapping this network model to some field theory, and that can be done. Uh, but to controllably, so, and you get the same signal model as from the microscopic white noise disorder, as Pruiskin did, but you need some large parameter to control some settle point expansion, a gradient expansion about the settle point. And that large parameter turns out to be this drew the conductivity, uh, sort of the bare conductivity of the model at small scales. And in this model, the bare conductivity is proportional to the number of channels on the link. Okay, so to really get the handle on the der derivation of the sigma model from the network model, you need n channels here. You get a generalization with n channels, and n should be large to control this mapping. Okay, that's another reason to do that. And for us, I mean, we wanted to have the system which has the bare conductivity, which is bigger than the fixed point conductivity. Right? So all these models with different ends, they're supposed to map to the same sigma model. Right, except, okay, I mean, even all the effect, of course, is present. So, so there's some, okay, I, I don't want to go into this detail, but that was the motivation. Hopefully this answers your question. Okay, uh, thank you. I see a question from Jacopo. Jacopo, please ask your question. Uh, hi, um, hey. can you hear me? Yes. Yes, um, I can hear you. So, when you discuss about the Dirac fermions in uh, in a disorder uh, potential, no, you had uh, some numbers for the exponent u depending on the energy, no, these numbers here. Yes. Uh -huh. So this number can be predicted, uh, let's say, using this Zinbauer argument uh, and uh, estimating a B1 uh, from those. Well, okay, so uh, I let me show the equations. I don't have the function. I mean, I, I don't have slides with the action for this theory. I maybe should have included them, but um, let me put it this way. So B1 is in principle can be computed just by doing some OPEs of the, uh, perturbation that takes you away from a critical point in the in the stable direction. So this irrelevant perturbation, okay? So the relevant direction is much more complicated. So this is just a guess. This, this has not been derived in, in the field theory. This term has been derived in the field theory. This has not, okay? And the, the reason is that uh, it's not clear what's happening there. Uh, the field in that, target manifold uh, of the sigma model has two parts. It has a compact part and a non-compact part as any supersymmetric field theory would have. And the compact part is really like, you know, something, something round and compact. And there's a particular sector there that is a compact boson. So you can expect that maybe some topologically non-trivial configurations of this compact boson can contribute. So this would be completely similar to the costellus stylus physics, okay? And uh, so the, the role of these topological configurations and excitations has not been studied at all and needs to be studied um, to even try to derive this term here. It's not been derived here, right? So 
the only thing we can say is that if you think about this um, effective exponent here is coming from the values of the irrelevant perturbation, right? Then that's where this dependence on the drew the conductivity may come in. But as I said, the details of this are not yet available. So we cannot predict anything from the field theory yet. I see. And sorry, maybe it's a na naive uh, question. So if I'm not wrong, in graphene also you have uh, um, uh, logarithmic scaling of some thermal conductivity with the system size. So. Um, well, okay. So that's okay. So that's a separate story. Let, let me, I can. So it's really, I think it's really not related to what I'm talking to you about, but I can tell you what I think you're talking about. So uh, graphene is also a Dirac fermion, basically, right? Mm. And you can ask what happens if you add different kinds of disorder. So what we added in our uh, model were all possible disorders, all right? So that's what places the system in the symmetry class appropriate for the integer quantum hole transition. But if you add only one type of disorder, you get a different symmetry, okay? It's a different symmetry class. Then particularly, you can make your system uh, by adding random mass perturbation. You can place it into the, what's called the class D in Turnbauer alt and Turnbauer classification. Mm -hmm. And that system has a metallic phase, okay? It has a quantum hole transition, but also a metallic phase. And that metallic phase has logarithmic singularities of all kinds and the conductivity and density of states and whatnot. So I think this is what you're talking about. Yes, okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. Thanks. So maybe Jacopo was uh, asking uh, whether this can teach us something and uh, there's certain similarity between different classes. Yeah, yeah, that's, that's a very good question. So I certainly know from Martin, from private communication, he's working on class C now, the spin quantum hole transition. He wants to describe it within a similar field theory. That, that story is kind of under better control because we now we actually have some exact predictions from microscopic map, mappings to population. Um, and class D is certainly very exciting. It's, it's, it's much richer in terms of the phase structure, phase diagram structure, but it's much more mysterious because the, some, the target space of the sigma model is not connected. There are two components and you can have some domain walls uh, propagating the system. So it's, it's a very complicated story, which, which is not um, yet understood. I mean, it's, it's certainly, I mean, it would be very interesting to understand. We have one more question from Fabio. Fabio, please go ahead. Uh, Thank you. Ilya, can you hear me well? Yes, yes, I can hear. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Thank you for this nice talk <laughs> and this beautiful result. Look, I, I know that you told, told us that, uh, that it is a puzzle for the dependence of new in terms of the energy, right? Because you, you, you change the energy and you, yes. have, and you get another new. Yeah, that's yeah, it's this it's one, awesome. right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Right? Uh, I know that uh, it is a puzzle and uh, you have different universal tests. but do you think that there is a topological argument behind this? Did you understand? Yeah, yeah, I understand the question. I'm trying to think about it. So, um, well, I'm not sure. The point is that, okay, there are different aspects of topology that uh, come into play here. So the topological, topological nature of the states away from criticality, right? That, that is destroyed as you approach the critical point. I mean, uh, the topology of the whole conductivity quantization on the plateaus is based on the uh, existence of either a gap in the spectrum or a mobility gap in the disordered system, right? You need a topology to, to be, so the robustness must be provided for in, by some physical means. And typically it's a, either a gap in the spectrum or the mobility gap. Now, once you approach the critical point where you have extended states, this is this out of the window. So the, this topology doesn't work anymore. But 
There's another type of topology, which is related to the, the ability for the field theory to have topological terms in it, all right? Right. And so in particular, this, this uh, sigma model that I mentioned has a topological term that comes from uh, either the Berry phase of the Dirac fermions as you go around the Fermi surface, or from some other reasons in the uh, white noise and the non-realistic particles and non -noise, white noise potential. So, but there's a topological term in the field theory that describe this transition. But if we uh, sort of try to do this mapping, at least in the regimes where it's sort of controlled, like for large energies or large number of edge channels in the Chopra quantum model, we get the same sigma model, right? Literally the same sigma model. So we don't really have any understanding why this, so the, the, the mapping predicts that you get the same field theory, so you should get the same critical exponents and you don't, right? And so that was a big puzzle. And I think the marginal scaling scenario has a chance of really explaining it because it just tells you that this is not the true critical you know, number. It's not the universal number that you get from these numerical simulations. It's just a effective exponent that turns out to be what it is, mm -hmm. right? And in, by the way, so topology also plays a role in Martin's theory. So this, this uh, sigma, it's not, sorry, the CFT that he is proposing is a Wesumina model. So it has a Wesumina term in it. It also has a topological origin, of course. And so that's, that's a very interesting. But okay, I'm not really going to talk about that. Right, thank you for, in, in, for answering. Mm -hmm. Okay, we, we don't have any more questions. So as a tradition, before we leave, I, I ask everybody to, who can uh, uh, turn on their cameras to, for us to register the participation. And Ilya, you need to uh, unshare your screen. Yes. Thank you. Thank you, thank you. So, Valdelino, I, please. I certainly hope to be able to visit sometime <laughs> and see this, this thing again in, with my eyes. All right. Well, if Biden is right soon, you'll be able to do so. Yeah, I hope so. But I mean, I don't know. What's the situation in, in Natal? I think, I think because Brazil is always a uh, few months behind. So I think it's yeah. approaching the peak now. But, uh, oh, I see. Yeah. Later the year, they'll All take right. this. Stay safe, wear masks, and uh, safe. I mean, social distancing, right? All this. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. All the best. Well, Delino, please tell us when when we're we're done. The picture. Okay. Thank you very much, and uh, I'll uh, I'll see you again uh, next week with more seminars. All right. Thank bye you. Bye. 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 bye.